Hello, this is Reen from Exam Help Web Today. I'll be solving Cambridge Physics Paper 2 AS Level Structured Questions 9702 Paper 2, Variant 2, February March 2020. Question number 1, Part A Land mass and temperature are all SI based units. State two other SI based units. So, one is time, that's in seconds, and the other one is current, which is in amperes. Part B, the acceleration of free fall G may be determined from an oscillating pendulum using the equation where L is the length of the pendulum and T is the period of oscillation. In an experiment, the measured values for an oscillating pendulum are um, length is 1.5 meters with a percentage uncertainty of 2 and T is 2.48 seconds with percentage uncertainty of 3. Part 1, calculate the acceleration of free fall G. So G is equal to 4 pi square into 1.5 ohmmeters divided by square of 2.48 that gives us g as 9.63 meters per second square but to determine the percentage uncertainty in g so since in the formula for g the two quantities which are length and time period they're getting divided so to get the percentage uncertainty for g we can add uh, those quantities uh, percentage uncertainties for the number of times they are being used in the equation for g so L is just getting used once while T is squared over here. So the percentage uncertainty for G is the percentage uh, of uncertainty for L plus the percentage of uncertainty of T multiplied by 2 since it is getting squared in the formula. And we get a total percentage uncertainty of 8%. Uh, use your answers in B1 and B2 to determine the absolute uncertainty for the calculated value of G. So the absolute uncertainty for G is percentage uncertainty of G divided by 100 into the value G, which is 9.63. And that gives me an absolute uncertainty of 0.77, which is also equal to 0.8 meters per second squared. Question number two, part A. A dolphin is swimming underwater at a constant speed of 4.5 meters per second. The dolphin emits a sound wave as it swims directly towards a stationary submerged diver. The frequency of the sound heard by the diver is 9560 Hz. The speed of sound in the water is 1510 meters per second. Determine the frequency to, to three significant figures of the sound emitted by the dolphin. So um, the frequency of the source is what we have to calculate while the frequency observed by the diver is 9560 Hz. The speed of source of the sound, which is of the dolphin, is equal to 4.5 meters per second. And V, which is speed of sound in water, is 1510 meters per second. The formula is observed frequency is equal to frequency of source into speed of sound in water divided by speed of sound in water plus or minus speed of the source. Where plus is in case where source of sound is moving away from observer here. Um, here in this question, the dolphin is approaching the diver which is said right over here that it directly swims towards a stationary submerged diver. We will be using the minus sign. So observed frequency is 9560 is equal to frequency of source into 1510 divided by 1510 minus 4.5 and that gives me a frequency of 9531.5 hertz. Part B, the dolphin strikes the bottom of a floating ball so that the ball rises vertically upwards from the surface of the water as illustrated in figure 2.1. The ball leaves the water surface with speed 5.6 meters per second. Assume that air resistance is negligible, so we are going to neglect air resistance. Part 1. Calculate the maximum height reached by the ball above the surface of the water. So before this ball leaves the surface, it has a speed of 5.6 meters per second. When it reaches to a height of h or a maximum height, its final speed would be 0. So initial speed is 5.6 and final speed would be 0. Air resistance in this case is being uh, neglected, meaning that um, acceleration will have a magnitude of negative 9.81. Now we can use the formula V square is equal to U squared plus 2AS to calculate the value for S and you get a height of 1.6 meters.
part 2 the ball leaves the water at time t is equal to 0 and reaches its maximum height at time t is equal to t. On figure 2.2 sketch a graph to show the variation of the speed of the ball with time t from t is equal to 0 to time t is equal to t. Numerical values are not required. So since we are neglecting a resistance our acceleration is going to be constant throughout this ball's motion and the slope is going to be negative because it is moving against the ground against the um, value g. So we'll have a straight line from the maximum speed So there is going to be a straight line from maximum speed which basically is 5.6 but since they're not asking us to label any excess so initial speed was 5.6 and as soon as it reaches its maximum height it uh, its final velocity was zero and it takes t seconds for the ball to reach this maximum height part 3 the mass of the ball is 0.5 0.45 kilograms. Use your answer in B part 1 to calculate the change in gravitational potential energy of the ball as it rises from the surface of the water to its maximum height. So gain in gravitational potential energy is equals to mass into G into H where mass of the ball is 0 0.5, 0 0.45 kilograms into 9.81 and the maximum height it covered was 1.6 meters and the change is of 7.06 joules. Part 4 state and explain the variation in magnitude of the acceleration of the ball as it falls back towards the surface of the water if air resistance is not negligible. So if air resistance isn't negligible then at first the ball will start moving towards the surface of water with increasing acceleration. At the, at the same time during this motion of the ball the resistance magnitude starts to increase too. And the time comes when the air resistance uh, gets greater than the ball's weight. At that time, actually, acceleration had decreased. So you can write that. Um, with the passage of time, air resistance increases. And when air resistance increases, acceleration would decrease. Question number three, part A state what is meant by work done? So work done is equals to force multiplied by displacement in direction of that force. Part B a skewer is pulled along horizontal ground by a wire attached to a kite as shown in figure 3.1. The skier moves in a straight line along a along the ground with a constant speed of 4.4 meters per second. The wire is at an angle of 30 degrees to the horizontal. The tension in the wire is 140 newtons. Part 1. Calculate the work done by the tension to move the skier for a time of 30 seconds. So work done by tension is equal going to be equal to the tension force which is of 140 newtons into distance in the tension's direction. So the distance this skier is moving is in the horizontal motion. So we must take 140 cos 30, which is the horizontal component of tension force, also in horizontal direction. Because work done requires both force and distance in the same direction. So the distance this is here is covering is also in horizontal direction as well as this tension. Now, so work done is equals to 140 cos 30, which is the force that causes this work done into the distance it is covering in the time interval of 30 seconds. Over here it is said that the skier has a speed of 4.4 meters per second means the skier is covering 4.4 meters of distance in one second. So in 30 seconds it will cover the distance of 4.4 into 30 which is 132 meters and this is how you get a work done of 1.6 into 10 to the power of 4 joules. Part 2. The weight of the skewer is 860 newtons. The vertical component of the tension in the wire and the weight of the skewer combined so that the skewer exerts a downward pressure on the ground of 2400 pascals. Determine the total area of the skis in contact with the ground. So pressure has a formula of force divided by area. Where we have the pressure is 2400 pascals. And the force that causes this 2400 pascals of downward pressure is the resultant due to the uh, vertical component of the tension which is 140 sine 30 and the weight of the skier that is 860 newtons.
So the force is going to be the resultant of both these forces. And since they are acting in opposite direction, so I must subtract both of them. So 140 sine 30 minus the weight of the skewer, which is 860 newtons, divided by area. And this is how I'll get an area of 0.33 meters square. Part 3, the wire attached to the kite is uniform. The stress in the wire is 9.6 inches to the power of 6 pascals. Calculate the diameter of the wire. So stress has a formula of force divided by area. So stress is 9.6 into 10 to the power of 6. The tension in the wire is of 140 newtons divided by area. And this is how you get an area of wire as 1.46 into 10 to the power of negative 5. This is also equals to pi r square where r is radius so you get a radius of 2.15 into 10 to the power of negative 3 when you multiply that by the 2 you get the diameter as 4.31 into 10 to the power of negative 3 part c the variation with extension x of the tension f in the wire in part b is shown in figure 3.2 a gust of wind increases the tension in the wire from 140 newtons to 210 newtons Calculate the change in strain energy stored in the wire. So strain energy can be calculated with the help of a graph by using the formula half into force F into extension X. The tension was increased from 140 newtons to 210 newtons. So the first step I would be taking is finding the strain energy in the wire when the force exerted was 140 newtons. So at force 140 newtons, we had an extension of one. Uh, 0.4 millimeters so at x is equal at f is equals to 140 newtons strain energy is equals to half into 140 newtons and 0.4 millimeters which I'll convert to meters so 0.4 divided by 1000 and the strain energy was 0.28 joules now at F is equals to 210 newtons. The strain energy was half into 210. An extension at 210 is of 0.6 millimeters. So again, 0.6 divided by 1000 to convert that to meters. And the strain energy is of 0 0.063 joules. So the change is of 0 0.063 minus 0 0.028 which is equal to 0 0.035 joules. Question number four, part A. For a progressive wave state, what is meant by part one, the wavelength? So wavelength is the distance between two adjacent wavefronts. These kind of definitions really need to be um, learned by heart. Part 2, the amplitude. Amplitude is the maximum displacement. You can remember this uh, with the help of displacement versus distance graph. Part B, a beam of red laser light is incident normally on a diffraction grating. Part 1, the diff diffraction of the light waves occurs at each slit of the grating. The light waves emerging from the slits are coherent. Explain what is meant by diffraction. So diffraction is um, spread of waves. So you can write um, waves they spread means waves have uh, diffracted. Uh, coherent waves are waves that have a constant phase difference. Part 2, the wavelength of the laser light is 650 nanometers, so uh, I'd better convert that to meters right here, so my negative 9. The angle between the third order diffraction maxima is 68 degrees as illustrated in figure 4.1. Calculate the separation D between the centers of adjacent slits of the grating. So for a diffraction grating, we have a formula D sine theta is equals to and lambda where uh, num uh, where n is equals to 3 in this question 
and that's the third order maximum forming. Lambda is the wavelength of the blue laser, which is 650 into 10 to the power of negative 9 meters. And theta is angle between this order maximum forming and zero order diffraction maximum, which lies straight from here. Although we have been given this total uh, angle, but theta is going to be just this angle, which is 68 by half. And that is 34 degrees. This is the angle which is required in the calculation. So by using the formula, n lambda is equals to d sine theta. d is equals to the maximum order forming is of third order. So 3 into lambda is 650 into 10 to the power of negative 9. And theta is the angle between the third order maximum and the zero order maximum. So sine 34. And you get a d as. 3.5 into 10 to the power of negative 6 meters. Part 3, the red laser light is replaced with blue laser light. State and explain the change of any to the angle between the third order diffraction maximum. So the blue light's wavelength is much shorter than that of red light. And so the theta would decrease as they are directly proportional according to this formula. So I can write that. blue light wavelength is shorter thus angle between the third order diffraction maxima decreases Question number five, part A, define the ohm. So they're asking you to define the unit for the resistance, which is one ohm. So one ohm is equals to one volt by one ampere. Part B, a wire has a resistance of 1.8 ohms. The wire has a cross-sectional area of 0.38 millimeters square and is made of metal of resistivity 9.6 into 10 to the power of negative 7 ohm meter. Calculate the length of the wire. So resistance is equal to resistivity of the material into its length divided by its area. Resistance of the wire is 1.8. Resistivity is of 9.6 into 10 to the power of negative 7 into length. And the area is... Uh, 0.38 millimeters square, so I'll convert that to meter square. I will divide this by 1000 square, and you get a length of 0.7125 meters. Part C A resistor X of resistance 1.8 ohms is connected to a resistor Y of resistance 0.6 ohms, and a battery P. The battery P has an electro electromotive force of 1.2 volts and negligible internal resistance. Part 1. Explain in terms of energy why the potential difference across resistor X is less than the EMF of the battery. So it is the rule that in series circuit, the PD across each component will vary uh, depending upon the resistance of that component and it will not be equal to the EMF of the battery. So I can write that PD across X is not equal to the EMF of the battery because some PD is being consumed by Y as well. So I can write that thermal energy is also dissipated by resistor Y. Part 2, calculate the potential difference across resistor X. So here comes the rule for the series circuit where EMF is going to be equal to PD across 1.8 ohms plus PD across 0.6 ohms. So EMF of the battery is 1.2. PD across X is going to be equal to its resistance multiplied by the current across it plus the resistance of resistor Y and then multiplied by the current. And the current is going to be the same across both resistors. So PD across X is 0.9 volts. Another battery Q of EMF 1.2 volts and negligible internal resistance is now connected into the circuit of figure 5.1 to produce the new circuit shown in figure 5.2. State whether the addition of battery Q causes the current to decrease, increase, or remain the same in part 1, resistor X. So for resistor X, the EMF uh, which we will be considering is going to be either this complete loop 
or it is going to be this outer loop ignoring this 1.2 volts so it's going to be either ways so you can write that there is going to be no change it remains the same Yes, but for um, battery P, since same terminals of two batteries, they are facing each other, the positive of this is facing the positive of this, and the negative of this is facing the negative of this. So PD is going to be the difference in them, means 1.2 minus 1.2, which is 0 volts. Thus, I can say that current across uh, battery P will be 0, or it will decrease. Part E, the circuit shown in figure 5.2 is modified to produce the new circuit shown in figure 5.3. Calculate the total resistance of the two resistors connected in parallel. So if 3.6 and 1.8 ohms are parallel in connection with each other. So 3.6 into 1.8 divided by 3.6 plus 1.8 and that gives me a combined resistance of 1.2 ohms. Part 2, the current in resistor Y. So the rule for the series circuit is of that. EMF of the battery is going to be equal to the sum of the PDs across each component. PD across this parallel combination will be the combined resistance of this parallel connection multiplied by the current across it plus the resistance of Y multiplied by the current across it. And so the value for I which is the current across um, resistor Y is 0.67 amperes. Question number six. A uniform electric field is produced between two parallel metal plates. The electric field strength is 1.4 into 10 to the power of 4 newtons per coulomb. The potential difference between the plates is 350 volts. Part A calculates the separation of the plates. So electric field strength is equal to voltage divided by distance between the charged plates. Electric field strength is of magnitude 1.4 into 10 to the power of 4. Voltage is of 350 volts and the distance between the charged plates is what we have to calculate and you get a distance of 0.025 meters. Part B, a nucleus of mass 8.3 into 10 to the power of negative 27 kilograms is now placed in the electric field. Electric force acting on the nucleus is 6.7 into 10 to the power of negative 15 newtons. Part 1, calculate the charge on the nucleus in terms of E, where E is the elementary charge. So electric field strength is also defined by force divided by charge. The electric field strength within that uh, region is of 1.4 into 10 to the power of 4 magnitude. The electric force being experienced by the nucleus is 6.7 into 10 to the power of negative 15. And the charge of the nucleus is what we have to calculate. And the charge you get is 4.786 into 10 to the power of negative 19 coulombs. And the question is asking us to get charge in terms of E. So each E, which is the elementary charge, has a charge of 1.6 into 10 to the power of negative 19. So 4.786 into 10 to the power of negative 19 coulombs can be divided by 1.6 into 10 to the power of negative 19 coulombs to get your charge in terms of elementary charge, and that is 3 elementary charge. But to calculate the mass in U of the nucleus, so each U has a mass of 1.67 into 10 to the power of negative 27 kilograms. Here in the question, the nucleus has a mass of 8.3 into 10 to the power of negative 27. So this can be divided by 1.67 into 10 to the power of negative 27. And you get a mass in terms of U as 5. Part 3, use your answers in B part 1 and B part 2 to determine the number of neutrons in the nucleus. So this nucleus, which I'll assume as X, has a mass of 5 and has a charge of 3. This over here is considered a proton number or a charge, while this over here is the nucleon number, meaning that it contains number of neutrons and number of protons. While this contains both of them and this contains number of protons, we can have a difference between them to get the number of neutrons, and that is of 2. So a number of neutrons present in this nucleus are 2. Question number 7, part A, state and explain whether a neutron is a fundamental particle. So a fundamental particle will never make, uh, will never make up quarks while a neutron does so. So I can write that neutron makes quarks, so not a fundamental particle.
it is not a fundamental particle. Part B, a proton in a stationary nucleus decays. Part 1 state the two leptons that are produced by the decay. So when a proton decays, it produces neutron, a positron, which is also called beta plus particle, and a neutrino. So I can write the two leptons being produced are beta plus particle and neutrino. The nucleus it produces isn't one of the two leptons. Part 2, part of the energy released by the decay is, going, is given to the two leptons, means to beta plus particle and neutrino. State two possible forms of the remainder of the released energy. So the rest of the energy, which doesn't go to beta plus particle and neutrino, is going to be either in form of uh, kinetic energy of nucleus, or it could be gamma radiation. So that's the end of the paper. Thank you for watching.